Okay, y'all, welcome to chapter seven lecture. Um, this is gonna be your first lecture, and this is the way most of these lectures will go. So make sure you've printed out this sheet, or at least have it directly in front of you listening to this video. Um, if you do not put pen to paper here, the, the video is pointless. You can't just watch something and expect to learn something. You have to, have to write it out. So please make sure you write it out. On another note, just as a class, um, Y'all, I know I, I got an, a, an email about office hours and there's there's unfortunately no way I can hold office hours for all of my classes. And the reason for that is I don't have childcare right now and I have two very small toddlers. And if you've ever tried to get an hour of quiet time with two small toddlers, it's, it's impossible. It's just simply impossible. And as much as I love you guys, I love them. And I can't just be pulling away three or four hours a day from their, from them. And instead what I do is I just, every 10 minutes out of every hour, I stop and I look at the discussion board and make sure that you guys don't have any questions. So if you have any questions, put them on the discussion board, write down the time in the video that you have a question, write down what your question is. But I've spent a lot of time um, outlining this stuff for you so, th so that you have all the information that you could possibly need. So I hope you guys can forgive me for that. There's just, unfortunately, just, just no way. And from what I've heard from students and what I've heard from other faculty members, it's annoying as heck anyways, because people forget to mute their mics. And like right now, I hear my dog in the background eating, and that's just one of me. So it's it can be a big distraction. So instead, put down your questions in the discussion board, mark the video. Um, time and I will answer your questions as quickly as possible. Again, I check once an hour. All right, so let's go ahead and start with chapter seven. It says, let's look at the difference between kinetic and potential energy. If you remember, kinetic energy is movement energy. So kinetic energy um, was one half mv squared, where mass uh, is m, v is velocity. And so essentially it's just related to how heavy something is and how fast it's going. Those are the two things that will affect um, the kinetic energy of, of a moving object. And then we have potential energy. Potential, if you remember, is m, m, g, h. It's mass times gravity times height. We talked about um, if you drop something, what's going to make it hurt more? And that's going to be, if it weighs a lot, that, that will make it hurt more. If it drops from really high up, that will also make it hurt more. So um, kinetic and potential energy are, are two different things, but let's, let's, look at, let's look at kind of what happens as you drop an object. So let's say you're, you're holding an object up here. This is you, yay you. And you're holding an object. Like, let's make it a box or something, I don't know. And you drop it and it falls. Apparently you're on a mountain. Let's make you on a mountain. It's a beautiful mountain. So you drop this object and it falls. Well, at the top, let's say you had 15 kilojoules of potential energy, because there's, before you dropped it, you had 15 kilojoules of potential energy. Once you have dropped it though, just before it hits the ground, it is now all transferred into 15 kilojoules of kinetic energy. So my question to you would be, what would happen if it's at the halfway point, when it was like right here? Well, what happens is, as potential energy starts to go down, kinetic energy starts to go up. But no matter what, you always have 15 kilojoules of energy in total. So as this one's falling, um, at, when it's halfway through, it's actually seven and a half potential energy and seven and a half kinetic energy. Now, my next question is, uh, if energy is conserved, what happens to an energy uh, to energy of an object when it is dropped? So when this object hits the ground, so you drop your box, it goes from here, it falls down, hits the ground, what happens to that energy? So even this pen, if I pick it up and drop it, does, does it all of a sudden just have no energy? Energy is conserved. It can't go anywhere. We have to have energy. So again, I pick it up, I drop it. I pick it up, I drop it. So it takes me 15 kilojoules to pick it up. As it starts to fall, it's 15, it's uh, half and half, potential and kinetic. And just before it hits the ground, it's all kinetic. But when it hits the ground, what happens? Well, hopefully right now you're screaming something or thinking something. Um, the main thing is, if you listen, sound. 
Um, the temperature actually slightly goes up. It's mechanical energy, but the energy chain can't just disappear. But it does dissipate as sound. And so when you drop an object and the sound comes off, it's actually a, a, a form of energy. And, and sound is energy. If you've ever sat in a car and turned the volume up really loud, it hurts your ears because it actually has the ability to do work on those little cilia inside your ears. So, um, so sound is energy. And, and the really cool thing about understanding this concept is if you can understand this concept, you already understand light. Let's move on to light. So let's move to the same concept uh, for electrons. Looking at electron, uh, single electron atoms. So single electron atoms would be hydrogen, helium plus. So make sure you're look, maybe looking at a periodic table. Um, lithium two plus. So if you got lithium, which would normally have three electrons in neutral form, you take two of those away, you only have one electron. So each of these has just one electron. Um, they would follow the same kind of concept. And pretty much this entire chapter, we're looking at single electron systems because multiple electron systems, that's when you get into, um, even you barely touch on it in quantum mechanics. So let's draw what it would look like. So the cool thing about atoms is if this is the nucleus, we'll put the nucleus there, is they have what we call energy levels. And in fact, Niels Bohr, who was this graduate student in a lab. Thanks. Thanks, Corduroy. You gave me a ball. I'm not playing ball with you, buddy. Imagine when my toddlers are awake. Okay, so we have a single electron system. The cool thing about it, Niels Bohr, who's a graduate student, came up with this idea. It's called the Bohr model. I think it's B-O-H-R. And what it is, it's used to describe an atom. And it makes it a really easy conceptual way to understand it. And here is how it goes. There are these discrete levels. So essentially, like, you can only pick up a pen, for example, one feet, two feet, three feet, four feet above the air. And you can, or above the ground. And you can't do that. Um, let me think about a better word, way to say it. Um, you can only do at one foot two foot, three foot. So when you pick it up only to one foot, you drop it down, it's always gonna have the same energy because you're always picking it up from one foot, dropping it at one foot, the sound dissipates for that one foot. Now electrons inside this single atom system <clears throat> can sit in any one of these energy levels. Now, let me go back over here and draw a model of, for example, the Earth. And let's say you pick up, if this is Earth, And let's say you pick up a ball. We'll make it a bowling ball so it doesn't bounce so we don't get in that discussion. You pick up a ball and you hold it right here and you drop it. Then sound comes off, right? As a result from you dropping it. I will go over here to the atom. So the cool thing about um, about atoms is these electrons can actually move inside the atom. So it can move from here to here to here to here. But it's discrete, meaning it can only move from here to here. It can't be kind of in between. It moves from here to here to here or here. And how it does that, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So let's say you move an electron to here. And we would call this, this is going to be n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let's say you go from the 1 to the 2 level. If you pick a ball up, and it's sitting on the two level, in this case, an electron up, and you sit on the two level and you let it go, it falls right back down. Now, with an object, when we drop the ball, our result was sound, right? But with an electron inside an atom, when the electron drops, its result is a photon, and photons are light, essentially just a light wave. That's all it is. So, what is light? Light is actually the sound of electrons falling. Light is the sound of electrons falling. <clears throat> so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, if it doesn't go back and rewatch this section again and see if see if I answer your question. Okay. Um, so the cool thing about light is it has the same speed in a vacuum. 
um, no matter what kind of light it is. And this you have to memorize. So inside a vacuum, which is probably the easiest, is we say inside a vacuum because when light hits other particles like um, oxygen or nitrogen or anything else that's in the air, it kind of slows it down. Um, but in a vacuum, it all has the same speed of light and that speed is 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. This has three sig figs. It's actually 2.99 something, if I remember correctly. But um, this is all I care about. Memorize it with three sig figs. Again, in case you missed it, that's C is the constant we use to describe the speed of light. And it's 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. Do you have to memorize this? Yes, please. Okay, so now let's look at how um, speed of light relates to frequency and wavelength. And some of this stuff you have to memorize, um, particularly this one um, concept here. So C equals um, lambda nu. Lambda is a symbol for wavelength. Wavelength. Wavelength is oftentimes given in nanometers, but we'll see here in a second, it has to be in meters. And then frequency is represented with this new, it's actually, it looks like a V, but it's kind of a, a V with a little bit of tequila in its system or something, it's kind of falling over. And this is frequency. And its units are inverse seconds. So you could say one over seconds, which is the same thing as saying seconds to the negative one. Now the reason I knew those units is because I just told you up here that C is in meters per second. And that means it has to end up being in meters per second. If you take meters here, let's go ahead and replace these with units. So our lambda was meters, our frequency, is one over seconds, and that should make sense because meters times one over seconds gives us meters per second. I'm gonna go put my dog outside. He's dying for me to throw this ball. So hopefully that gave you some time to um, answer or think through some things. Um, let's go ahead and look at this next page here. There's a few things I wanted to point out. Um, I'm actually going in a slightly different uh, order than I would normally teach this stuff, but that's because... Um, I don't know, I think you guys can handle it. So we're gonna talk qualitative stuff and then we'll talk quantitative stuff. Uh, just per the equation that we just looked at, which is C equals lambda nu. So let me go ahead and rewrite that here. So C equals wavelength times frequency. We know that if the wavelength goes up according to the equation because C is a constant, it's 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. If wavelength goes up, frequency must go down. They're inversely proportional. If frequency goes up, wavelength must go down. And we'll talk about how frequency is related to energy um, in a little bit here, but mainly this stuff over here is going to be higher energy, and the stuff over here will be lower energy. You're hit with radio waves all day long and you survive just fine. Um, you're hit with a gamma ray, you, you, you wouldn't feel as great. So these are higher energy, they can do a lot more damage over here. Um, radio waves, not so much, they're, they're all over the atmosphere right now. So um, visible light, however, is just this tiny little spot right here. And again, all these waves are traveling at 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. So visible light's just this tiny little part of the spectrum right here. And what I do want you to memorize here is a wavelength and color. And I just say a bit because it's good to have a general idea of what's going on. First, think about um, the fact that this guy over here is going to be higher energy because, again, I told you going this way will be higher energy, high frequency, high energy. So this is a high energy. Purple's higher energy. This is a lower energy. 
But the next thing is I want you to actually think through memorizing a few of these. So let me show you how simple this could be. And I'm gonna, I'm just, let's just make something up. We know that, let's say violet, blue, orange, and red for 400, 500, 600, and 700 nanometers. Videos, videos are boring. B-O-R, videos are boring. Four, five, six, seven, just like that. You have memorized this and managed to insult me at the exact same time. Well done. <coughs> All right, so <clears throat> let's look at the a uh, little bit more here. Here's an explanation for a few different types of light. So in the Bohr model, here we talked about how an electron falls, it lets off light. Well, if we pick up an object really high and it falls, it lets off more sound, right? It, it lets off more energy. So if we pick something up really high, it makes bigger sound than picking up something just a little high. So let's go ahead and relate that over here to this guy. If, if you look closely, and it's easy to miss this detail, falling from um, the, or each individual level, and we talked about them being labeled one, two, three, etc. each individual lo level has um, a type of light. Here's ultraviolet, visible, and infrared. Falling to one, two and three energy levels respectively. So the first, the second, and the third energy level respectively. Now look at the arrow size here. This is essentially uh, analogous to the distance that something would fall. What would make the biggest noise? If you're dropping something from here all the way down to here, or if you're dropping just a little way from here to here. And hopefully you understand that dropping from here to here would make the biggest noise because it takes them, it would let off the most energy. And by the exact same concepts, Dropping from here to here will let off the highest energy light. Well, what's high energy light? What does that have to do with frequency? Oh yeah, that means it's gotta be a high frequency. And that makes sense because we already memorized Vbor. Violet over here is really high energy. So ultraviolet, even one more to the left, is really high energy. So I'm looking at this over here. As we drop from here to here, this is gonna be higher energy. Another really important concept here is just to memorize it. So let's take some time to think about it. Whenever you drops, uh, whenever an electron drops and it falls to the n equals one energy level, it's ultraviolet. I don't know, tanning is number one. I, I, I don't tan. I worked at a tanning salon, that's why I'm it's horrible. Don't do it. And then number two is uh, visible light, that's the stuff you see, though you can see a little bit of ultraviolet too. And then number three, falling to three and even actually four and five, um, but the main one is memorizing that it falls to three, is infrared. And why is that important? Well, we already know that visible light, right, was 400 to about 750 nanometers. We know that UV light must be higher in energy, so that means lower in wavelength, right? So UV light is going to be less than 400 nanometers. And infrared light is going to be greater than 750 nanometers because it's going to be lower in energy, so it's got to have a higher wavelength. Remember that wavelength and frequency are inversely proportional, so that's how I knew. That, <clears throat> that UV was higher energy, so it's got to have a lower wavelength, and infrared is uh, lower energy, so it's got to have a higher wavelength. This is important because when you get to problems, I'm going to refer back to this, and I'm going to show you how to knock out some answers that wouldn't even make sense on an exam, and, and get you to where you might not even have to do a calculation if you understand these simple little things right here. All right, so let's move on to the next page. I've talked a lot about frequency. I told you it's inverse seconds. But what the heck does that mean anyways? It's all weird. 
until you put a fist on it. I'll show you what I mean by that. All right, so let's look, let's look at three different um, wavelengths. Wavelength one, or not wavelengths, waves I should say, is that. Number two, is that. Number three, is that. Now oftentimes, it's confused, it gets confused where you look at this and you're like, that's going faster. What speed are they all going though? They all are going the exact same speed. They're all going 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second. But they differ in two different ways. One, and I'm, I'm gonna guess I'm gonna go out of order here, so I apologize. One way is wavelength, right? Because we said that this is equal to wavelength times frequency. So the two things that are gonna be affected are wavelength and frequency. Wavelength is the distance between any equivalent points in, in, a, in a wave. So between here and here and here and here. So this one has the smallest wavelength. And this one over here has a big wavelength. The distance between the two crests is where I usually look at it, but you could look at any, any point that's equivalent in there. It'll all be the same dis distance. But what really tends to get people the most is frequency. And I think I finally knocked this one out. Um, let me grab this random piece of cardboard that my son drew on today. It's so cool. Look at his little, look at his little baby hands. I don't know if you can see that. They're so cute. Okay, so he traced his hands and his feet. His feet look funky. All right, so let me go ahead and hold this right here. All right, so they're all traveling at the same speed, right? And it's really hard to, to understand frequency until um, you, you actually really visualize it or actually see it. So let's go ahead and pretend that over here, oh, hopefully my son doesn't see this. I'm sorry, son. Let's go ahead and draw the face of somebody who's about to be punched in the nose. And they're saying, ah. Okay, so this dude's about to be punched in the nose. How do I know he's about to be punched in the nose? Because I'm about to draw on here. Let's go like this. Um, a punching glove on every single one of these little peaks. I won't sit here and do it on all of them, but I do want to do it on a few to prove a point. So they're all supposed to be the same size punching glove. And again, what we're talking about here is frequency. Okay, so if there's a punching glove on every single one of these and you're about to hit this guy, which one would you rather be hit with? Let me do that again. So they're all moving at the same speed. Boom, 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 boom. It looks to me like the third one, dude's getting punched a lot. And if dude's getting punched a lot, that means this one carries a, it packs a punch. It packs, hey, I've never thought of that. It packs a punch. This one has the highest energy, also the highest frequency. It's hitting him more often, boom, 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 boom. Whereas this one up here only hits him twice. Big wavelength, low frequency. Small wavelength, high frequency. And hopefully that makes sense. Again, it gets hit more, high frequency. Boom, boom, boom. Poor guy. And hopefully my son doesn't, doesn't see that. Okay. He'll be okay. Okay. So this constant... I'm missing one. I am missing one. Let me put it back. There you go. <clears throat> I got ahead of myself. So. All right, so we looked at frequency, we looked at wavelength, and hopefully, uh, hopefully that makes some sense to you. Now let's move on to another qualitative topic, which is refraction. 
<coughs> so light <coughs> is different from what we're used to. For example, if you've got a car and you drive your car off a cliff, a truck, I'm kind of into trucks now. Okay, so you got a car, truck, and it's about to drive off a cliff. Whoa, but at the bottom of the cliff is some water. It's gonna fall in the water pretty fast and then slow down and it might like change directions a little bit and end up over here, slowly sinking to the bottom. But I think you'll agree that when it hits this water, it's going slow. It's slowly submerging. All right, now let's think about light. Light is a wave, as we kind of discussed already. It's, it's the sound of electrons falling. And when light hits water, so let's say we got water, and you put light in at the same angle. Is this is light. It does the same thing. It slows down and it slightly changes direction. And this is how um, you can, for example, stick your finger in a cup of water and it looks like your finger's cut off. Or you can do lots of cool stuff. I'm gonna post a video link to um, a cottonseed oil. <clears throat> to a cottonseed oil video, which is really cool because cottonseed oil and glass uh, have the same refractive index, which means that speed of light is the same in both of them. And so you can't see glass inside cottonseed oil. It's really cool. So as this guy <clears throat> hits the water, it's gonna slow down, it's gonna change direction. And that's what allows um, things to appear different when they're in water. Now diffraction is a little bit different. Um, this is very similar, I think, to a, a particle with the exception of as soon as this thing emerges from water. So let's say that it was like, somehow the water was sandwiched here and it came back out of water, it would have gone and resumed its exact same direction and its exact same speed. It's really trippy and cool. All right, but diffraction is something a little bit different. So if you go and grabbed a handful of sand and let's say I just hold this paper up. Let's keep it over so you don't look at poor Max Planck. Okay. So let's say you put a hole right there and I threw some particles or even just dropped them in there. What would happen is the particles holes would just go through. And on the other side over here, you'd see where they landed. And it's pretty much that simple. You drop them through the hole and they'd land on this side. Light, however, is a little bit different. If you shine a light here through a hole, what's gonna happen is the light will actually come up through <clears throat> and bend through the other side. It's crazy. So let me let me uh, depict that visually here. So let's say you've got like a cardboard or something with a hole in it and you throw particles at it. These two maybe will go through and the rest will hit the sides and deflect, right? Um, so I'm throwing sand through a hole and this comes through and then it'll eventually land over here. With light though, if you take light and shine it through, you need the sound effects of course. What happens is it goes through, but it also comes around like that. And if you hold your hand on the other side of the paper with, that's got a hole in it, what you're going to see is that your hand lights up because the light can bend around things and that's called diffraction. So refraction is bending of light when it hits something like glass, um, water, air, cottonseed oil, etc. Diffraction is just light in general, just bending around things. It's its tendency to bend around things. Okay, so now that we know a little bit more uh, qualitative information, let's look quantitatively at it. So, now we, now we can finally get to, to poor Mox. Max. Oh, all right, so these are rockin' physicists who look like this before and after, 
and developed a constant you have to memorize. So first, this is the constant you have to memorize. Um, it's ca called Planck's constant. It's, oh, I spelled Planck wrong. It's actually NCK, my bad. I, I think it's that, NCK. Um, and it's H equals 6.626 times 10 to the negative four joules times seconds. You will absolutely have to memorize that. So 6.626 times 10 to the negative third, 34 joules per second memorize. We'll get into how to use it here very shortly. <clears throat> okay. Let me get a little closer here. So the constant, this constant relates energy to frequency. So we already understood that stuff with a high energy uh, or a high frequency has a high energy and that was because of this we said hey if it's got a really high frequency it's got a lot of energy um and we also explained you know it packs a big punch and that's why so uh the way that we relate those things quantitatively is through uh max planck and the equation that i want you to memorize is this one it's the change in energy equals h nu and we already know because c equals nu times lambda, that nu must equal c over lambda. So essentially I just replace nu here with c over lambda. Equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18. So here's an 18, here's an 18, look at the negative, negative, times one over n final squared minus one over n initial squared. So let's use the billy boppers out of that one equation. I've never said billy boppers until I wrote this, apparently. Again, the question is, the equation is delta E equals H nu equals HC over lambda equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 times one over N final squared minus one over n initial squared. Chances are you just looked at the equation up here and rewrote this or listened to me and rewrote what I was writing and that's not gonna help you. Memorize it, do it now, write it down, figure it out. We're gonna use the heck out of this equation right now. Oh, that's why I said Billy Boopers. I didn't wanna say heck or something. Okay. So it says a dental hygienist uses x-rays um, and it says lambda equals 0 0.50 angstroms. Angstroms, by the way, is 10 to the negative 10 meters. So anytime you see this A with a funny little hat, that's 10 to the negative 10 meters. Golly, you guys are falling. Okay, so it says, takes a series of dental radiographs while the patient listens to a radio station and it tells you how many meters that is and looks out a window at a blue sky and it tells you nanometers and it asks for the frequency of this stuff. Well, there's uh, two ways we can do it, but I'm gonna use the master equation to show you how this thing works. First, it gives us information and it asks for, it's essentially three different problems. It gives us a wavelength and it asks for the frequency. So you go up to our master equation and you say, hey, what has wavelength and what has frequency? And let's underline them, this one and that one, right? So H nu equals HC over lambda. Again, I know that it was asking for, it gave me a wavelength and it was asking for frequency in each of these questions. So if I know the wavelength and it's asking for frequency, I come up here and say, hey, what has frequency and what has wavelength up here? Those are the two things that I underline. Now I can go ahead and solve this problem. It's H and H are on both sides of the equation. So you could divide them out or just if anytime you have the same thing on both sides, they cancel. So now my equation is essentially nu equals C over lambda. You could have also done C equals nu times lambda over here. And now we just kind of set them up. Well, I told you already, let's do the first one. Let's do the zero point five zero angstroms. 
I told you that that was actually equal to um, 10 to the negative 10 meters. And so our frequency for this first one is equal to C, which we know is 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, divided by 0 0.50 times 10 to the 10, 10 to the negative 10, excuse me, meters. And if you calculate this out, you get an answer of 6.00 times 10 to the negative 18. Our meters will cancel and our, we're left with inverse seconds, s to the negative one, which is the same thing as saying one over s again. Now you can do that for the other ones, but again, you always wanna make sure that your this lambda down here is in meters. So if we did it for the radio signal, the radio was 325 centimeters. So our new would be 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second, divided by 325 times 10 to the negative two meters again, because we know centi is equal to 10 to the negative two. If you calculate that out, you get an answer of 9.23 times 10 to the seven seconds inverse. And I suggest you guys do this because it's easy to forget that you gotta put parentheses around it. It's easy to mess up on these little things. And this is one that you don't wanna get wrong on an exam. So practice, practice, practice. In fact, I'll let you practice the next one on your own. So I suggest pausing it um, and figuring it out. So I'll let you pause it now before I tell you the answer. All right, cool. So this one is 473 nanometers, which is 10 to the negative nine meters. And if you calculated it out to find the frequency, you'll find that the frequency of this one is 6.34 times 10 to the 14 inverse seconds. Now those I actually had calculated, the rest of them I didn't calculate because I wanted to calculate them with you as we go. Okay, so one says a hydrogen atom absorbs a photon of light and its electron enters the N equals four level. A photon of, wait, UV light. UV light, what do we know about UV light? It says to calculate the change in energy of the atom and then eventually the wavelength of the absorbed photon. Okay, cool. I got no idea what they're asking yet. So I'm, I, I really do, just kidding. But if you have no idea what they're asking yet, draw out your master equation. Do you remember what it was? It's the change in energy of an atom. We can even denote that it's an atom. Equals H nu equals H C over lambda equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18. And that's actually joules times one over n final squared minus one over n initial squared. Okay, let's see what information we have. It said change in energy of the atom, that's over here. And it says enters the n equals four, n equals four, hey, n. Hey, we got some N information over here, and those are the two parts of the equation that you'll be using for this one. So let's go ahead and write it down for the first part, A. Delta E atom equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times one over N final squared minus one over N initial squared. Well, it says a hydrogen atom absorbs a photon. Maybe we should take a second to talk about the difference between absorbing and emitting. But if you absorb a punch, you just got punched, right? <laughs> Versus emitting a punch, you're, you're punching somebody. This is really analogous to um, a lot of the enthalpy discussions that we've been having. So, when, so essentially what it's saying is you've got an atom I guess we didn't really spend too much time talking about what causes it to jump up energy levels. But if you have an electron sitting in, for example, the n equals one, the only way 
and go from the one to the two to the three to the four, from the one to the four, is if it absorbs enough energy to do that. In fact, it actually has to absorb the exact amount of energy in order to do that. A UV light energy. How do I know UV light? Well, wait a second. It said UV, but we also know that UV is starting at the n equals one level. So if it absorbs from here to the four, it's got to have absorbed UV light. If it falls back down, it's going to emit UV light. So here's a picture of emission. If I change the sign of that arrow, that would be absorbing. Absorbing is increasing in energy. Emitting is releasing energy. Absorbing, increasing in energy. Re emitting, releasing energy. So it had to absorb a photon of UV light to pop up here. Energy levels are discrete, so the amount of, so the energy of the photon that hit it, so essentially you got a photon, you shine light on an atom, and the energy level goes up. If this was four and this was one, we can now figure out this problem. There's another thing I want to stop, stop for a second and talk to you about before we go and finish this problem, which is just, now it's just a matter of plugging and chugging. And that's conceptually thinking about what this means. So if you have um, those cool little like, stars, or if you ever had them growing up that glow in the dark on your ceiling, and you want your stars to shine really brightly, what do you do? You shine light on them, right? The reason you're shining light on them is you want them to absorb energy. So you're shining photons on the, the, the glow in the dark stuff. It absorbs this energy, and that allows it to slowly emit that energy throughout the night. Um, that's called phosphorescence. It's a little slightly different, but overall, it's the same concept that electrons are falling, and by seeing uh, something glow in the dark, that means the electrons are falling, and you're watching them fall. It's so cool. All right, so let's go back over here. We're calculating the energy of the atom. We know that it's negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times one over n final squared. Where did we end up? It absorbed, that means it had to go up in energy. So our final is one over four squared. Our initial is one over one squared. And now we can calculate this out. Um, I was gonna do it all at once, but let's go ahead and, and break it down. Let's do um, the one divided by four squared, which is uh, one over 16 minus one and I get an answer of here, negative uh, 9.375 times 10 to the negative one. So let me actually rewrite that. I get 0 0.09375. I can do it, no. No, I should have not taken a melatonin. Not 0 0.9375, I got it. In other words, it's going to be 93 0.75% of this times negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And again, this one was negative, and I get a positive answer of 2.04 times 10 to the negative. 18 joules, 2.04 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. Let's talk about why that answer makes sense and should make sense. Let's say we have an atom that, or an electron that's going to go to infinity. So, boom, 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 boom. And I say, hey, how much energy would it release? If, like, let's say you shot a photon on it and it ionized. If an atom ionizes, that means it's lost an electron, right? So let's say it goes from the n equals 1 all the way to n equals infinity. So it goes from this first energy level all the way to infinity. Well, let's go ahead and use our master equation to figure that out. You got negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 times 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. And you want to take this electron again to go from 1 to infinity. So you'd say negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 
times 10 to the negative 18 times 1 over your final, which would be infinity squared, minus 1 over your initial, which is 1 squared. And we go ahead and solve for this. Well, 1 over infinity squared is this bottom number gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. This is essentially going to 0, right? And so now we have negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 times 0 minus 1. And that would equal 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. This is the maximum amount of energy that something can, it can absorb. Max E that an electron can absorb. All right. All right, so the highest possible amount of energy that any photon can have is 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. So when we go over here, did our answer make sense? Well, you should always make sure that it's smaller than that 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. And in fact it is, and so that automatically gives you some answers. And it's almost always going to be negative 18, negative 19, negative 20 kind of a range. All right, the next question. For a hydrogen atom, what is the wavelength of a photon emitted when an electron drops from the 4D to the 2S in a hydrogen atom? All right. We are not talking about orbitals yet, and we're not going to be talking about orbitals for a while, but there's a lot of information that you can actually obtain from this. That is an N, and that is an N. So essentially we're going from an N equals, uh, well, let's, let's talk about it. It says emit it when it drops from an N equals four to an N equals two. So it looks a little bit different, but this is a question that would likely show up, so I want you to get used to it. Um, your N, we don't even have to worry about the D or the S. That's not going to affect um, the wavelength at all. Oh, we didn't really finish this, did we? The wavelength of it absorbed. Ah, darn it. Fiddle, fap, and billy bops. Let's go back up here. Let's ensure that we finish this one because I really, I really want to make sure you guys are comfortable with this stuff. So we got 2.04 times 10 to the negative 18 joules. The next question is the wavelength um, of the absorbed photon. So um, going back to our problem that we have, our master equation, we know delta E atom equals H nu equals HC over lambda equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. And now it's asking us to find wavelength. Well, we already know the change in energy of the atom now. We just don't know wavelength. So we could um, choose a variety of different things, but this is probably the easiest thing to do. And now we say, okay, delta E atom, which we already calculated, is equal to HC over lambda, where H is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34, joules times seconds, times C, which is 3.00, times 10 to the eight meters per second, all divided by lambda, which we're solving for. So I'm gonna go ahead and plug that in my calculator here. I'm going to have to let my poor dog in. So I set that equal to 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 7. And I get an answer that lambda is 9.726 times 10 to the negative eight. And that would be in meters. Now, the next question always should be, does that answer make sense? Well, if you put this into nanometers, that would be 97 nanometers, 97.3 nanometers. Does, does that answer make sense? Well, let's go back. What kind of light did this absorb? It absorbed 
UV light. Wait a second, UV light is higher in energy than visible light. We know that videos are very boring, right? And we also know that UV light is higher in energy than visible light, and so it should be less than 400 nanometers. And let's go back and look at this. Is this slightly less than 400 nanometers? On, on an order of magnitude, it absolutely is, and this makes total and utter sense. All right, let's go back to this one. We've got wavelength of a photon emitted, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at um, now wavelength, which is hc over lambda, that's that part of the master equation, and we've got some n's, equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules, times one over our n final to n initial. I like to kind of stop and, and ask myself what's happening. It says the electron dropped. If you drop something, is it going to absorb energy or emit energy when it falls? It's gonna emit that sound, right? So we're automatically looking at something um, that started higher and ended lower. It dropped, it emitted the, the photon, and that's why our final is actually two, and our initial was four. Now we can go about plugging this in. 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times speed of light, 3.00 times 10 to the eight meters per second, all divided by lambda, which we don't know. And we set that equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 times 1 over 2 squared, which is 4, minus 1 over 16. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in over here. Check it right. Yep, and I get four. I get four hundred eighty six nanometers. So my lambda equals four hundred eighty six nanometers. Now you might have gotten. Um, you should have gotten actually a negative number, but the reason it should make sense that it's negative is that would be the energy of the atom. So it released that energy. Um, the atom actually lost that energy, but the, the mag you're going to always take the magnitude no matter what, because it released that energy and, um, the photon, no matter what is going to have the same frequency if it absorbs it or if it releases it because just like potential and kinetic energy it takes 15 kilojoules to drop it 15 kilojoules to pick it up it's conserved it's going to be the same amount no matter what all right so what is the energy of a photon with a wavelength of 525 nanometers the energy of a single photon with a wavelength of 525 nanometers uh, if we go and look at our master equation uh, we're looking for energy and if we, we can figure out the energy of an atom, we can figure out the energy of that individual photon. So change in energy of an atom, which would actually be equal to the energy of a photon. You could even write it that way. Equals the wavelength of, this is H, C over lambda. And essentially we're just gonna solve for this. So 
we're looking at 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by 525 nanometers, which you'd have to put as 525 times 10 to the negative nine meters. Remember, you're placing nano with that. So as we go through and solve it, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 times three times 10 to the eighth divided by 525 times 10 to the negative nine. And I get an answer that should make sense. But ask yourself right now, what should an energy of any photon be? Remember, it's always going to be less than 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18. And in fact, that's exactly what you get. So I get an energy of 3.79 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Another question is, which energy level is this falling to? Well, it's 500 nanometers. 500 nanometers is visible light. What energy level is that? It's going to be the two. So there's a lot of information we can figure out from this. So another question that could be asked on an exam is, hey, which energy level is this falling to? You wouldn't even have to calculate it. You look at 525 and you're like, hey, that's visible light. It must be two, no matter what. Okay, now this is actually kind of a continuation, this next question. How many photons are in a flash of light that contains 189 kilojoules of energy? if the wavelength of light is 525 nanometers. Well, if we, um, let, let's go ahead and look at this in a, in a few different ways. This is flash of light. That means a whole bunch of light. It's not just one measly little photon from one tiny electron falling. It's not just this. One photon gives you 10 to the negative 19. This is a crap ton of photons giving you one point, or 189 kilojoules of energy. The question is how many are in there? Well, let's take a step back because this is our last problem so we can spend a little extra time on it. Let's take a step back and see what happens if I gave you the following information. Let's say I say a rock weighs two pounds. And then I've got a big old sack of rocks and it weighs 40 pounds, but I don't know how many rocks are in there. And I say, hey, how many rocks are in this 40 pound bag? Well, you automatically in your head probably say, well, you, you know that it's 40 pounds and you know that each one of them is two pounds and therefore there must be 20 rocks, right? That same exact principle can be used here. You know that all these photons together, so this was one measly photon, but if you have more and more and more and more and more and more and more, they give off 189 times 10 to the third joules of energy. The question is, how many are in there in total? You know that each one of those gave off this, but all together, they're 189 times 10 to the third. So to figure out how many are in there, you take the biggest amount, 189 times 10 to the third joules. I don't know why I made that a tiny joule. And divide it by the little guy, 3.79, or girl, you don't want to be sexist, times 10 to the negative 19 joules. Let's go ahead and calculate it out. 189 times 10 to the third divided by 3.79 times 10 to the negative 19. And I get, that there are a lot in there, almost a mole, 4.9 9 times 10 to the 23rd photons. So again, one single photon with this wavelength of energy, or this, excuse me, this wavelength of light gave off this tiny little bit of energy. But if we had a whole bunch of them compounded in a flash of light with this much energy, that means we had to have had this many photons, 4.99 times 10 to the 23rd. Um, if you have any questions at all, get back with me again yeah this says i won't be going over over orbitals kind of like i told you up here until we cover some stuff in chapter eight um chapter eight's coming next this was pretty much a 
a streamlined but I think very thorough covering of, of chapter seven. So please make sure you watch this again or slow it down or take your time or write your questions and post to the discussion board. Um, because again, I will check it every single hour and I am, I'm in this as much as I can be for you guys. I think checking it every single hour is actually reaches more people than a one hour long session with technical difficulties. So ask your questions, please don't be afraid, and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Have a great week, y'all. Maybe it won't stop.